Are you curious about bodies, pleasure, and possibilities? And what about curious about what others are up to on the planet when it comes to pleasure, sex, and play? Have you considered what pleasure can do for your life, your body, and your bank account? Do you know something magical, delightful, and out of this world orgasmic is not only possible for you, but totally available to you? If you're ready to be the magical, sexual, sexy beast you know you can be, and you just need the tools to get there, you're in the right place. Now, here's the host of The Pleasure Zone, sensual movement artist, relationship, and sex alchemist, Milica Yelenich. Welcome, my sweet pleasure seekers. You guys are joining in on a fun show tonight. A kiss is not a contract. This title came to me from watching a show on Crave called Flight of the Concords. And these are two New Zealand dudes who are absolutely hilarious. And in all of their episodes of their shows, so two seasons of shows, um, every episode has at least two to three random songs that they bust out in. And I have to say that their songs make my gut hurt from laughing so freaking hard um, that we we have gone back and found them on YouTube just to listen to the music randomly for laughs. And uh, the other day we were kind of joking about, my mom was joking and she said, you really got to make, you really got to make a show, one of your shows be with that title, A Kiss Is Not A Contract. And so, and so as luck would have it, this is what we are having tonight, A Kiss Is Not A Contract. And then I started to think, uh, but is it? And how many times has it been a contract? Oh, yeah. So that goes back pretty far. We will be talking about how kisses have been contracts, how maybe things have changed uh, now in, in our time that maybe kisses aren't the same thing and why that is, how that's come to kind of change. But just for fun, when we look at this just for fun, is like how far back is the oldest recorded kiss? And actually what I found in my research is the oldest recorded kiss that we know of is in the Vedas, Vedic scriptures, and it goes back to 1500 BC, which I think is rather funny that we're using BC uh, in relation to Vedic scriptures. So we're going to call it BCE, before the common era, instead of before Christ in reference to Hindu scriptures, because that's just hilarious and weird. So 1500 BCE, before the common era, we have uh, an actual description of a kiss in scriptures. And there have been further descriptions of kisses in different scriptures and different writings that have been found throughout history. Some of them are, you know, a couple thousand years old. Some of them are only a thousand or two thousand years old. Regardless, kisses have been around a very long time. And some of them are described very interestingly, like some kisses are described as when the two lips meet and the feeling arouses in your body that is, um, they say, so like incredibly pleasurable, right? So they're trying to explain how kisses have and can have a, a very erotic and pleasurable feeling sensation to them and I have to agree I've had kisses in my life that have absolutely been orgasmic um, and I've allowed that to show up so depends on uh, you know who you're kissing how you're kissing and all that jazz but kisses can be incredibly erotic and and believe it or not kisses can be contractual so these days not so much we don't really have the sense of kisses being contractual these days uh, or you can imagine that, you know, people getting together on things like Tinder, going out for good times over a night, that, that kiss, if that kiss is a contract, then think about what all the rest of the sex is, would, you know, all the rest of the sex that people are having would be, if, you know, that would be automatic marriage. But the kiss is actually, in a lot of traditions, a, a symbol during the ceremony of marriage for a contract, right? So it goes way back. Yeah, so we're gonna be talking about all of that tonight. So you're listening to The Pleasure Zone. For those of you who have never listened before, you're gonna find this show offers a, such a wide range of topics from anything from different kinks 
to just some interesting historical information, sociological, uh, anthropological information, psychological takes on things as well. And I look at things from as many multiple perspectives as I can possibly find research on and always looking for more information. So if you are an avid listener of the show and you're wondering about certain topics, if you're wondering if I have talked about certain topics, by all means, give me a little, send me a little note, write to me uh, and let me know what you're interested in. I would love to hear that. I do have ways you can contact me through my, um, you can always join my, my mailing list and get on my email list so that you can get receive emails from me and write to me by all means you can find me on social media and send me messages if you are sending me messages about a topic please write in your uh, message at the very first line this is a topic for a show otherwise uh, or this is in uh, regards to a show i listen because i do get a lot of messages and if i don't see something that has uh, relevance to something that you'd like me to talk about or something that you'd like to talk to me about, I usually pass it over, um, which, you know, the, the random masturbation videos I get sent, uh, if I don't have any context for it, I'm not going to respond, which I had a few this week. So uh, that's all good. I would like some context. By all means, I'm, if you're sending me contacts to say, hey, here's a plan, I would like some feedback on this video, i.e., can you tell me what this is, or can you give me insight on this or something, then yeah, I might have a conversation. But yeah, random stuff, I don't even know what you're looking for. So try and be clear. Communication, as you'll find on this show, I talk about it all the time. Communication is key, which is interesting. We talk about a kiss is not a contract, generally a kiss would have been a communication that could have been a contract. So let's look at that history part that I, that I wanted to kind of examine a bit. Let's take it back to Roman times because there is evidence in Roman times of kisses being contracts. Um, so you might've heard the term sealed with a kiss and sealed with a kiss is actually a term that was used for contracts and having contracts become legal or binding was through kissing a person. So you know when you write on a letter XOXOXO and the X is a kiss, that is part of the bind of the contract. So isn't that fabulously interesting? And that goes way back. So why did people do that? Well, if you think about some contracts, when people didn't have the skills like writing skills, if they didn't, if they weren't literate and if they didn't have skills for writing, then they would just be told, put your X on the spot. Well, that is sealed with a kiss. Isn't that fascinating? So putting your X as your marker is the same as sealing it with a kiss, which what predated that was actually kissing as a form of a contract to bind a contract. So when uh, when now when we say sealed with a kiss, we're usually meaning something a little bit cuter, like you put the envelope, you put a kiss on it, and you're sending love. Very different than than having a binding contract, isn't it? And so not as playful to have a binding contract. It could be for anything, but when we look at those kind of Roman times and people having these binding contracts through kisses, is most people did not have the a, they didn't have the paper to write stuff on. I mean, there was paper, but not everybody had that. There was different papyrus, I'm sure, and different things that they could have gotten uh, from Egypt or around the world. There were cloth things that could be written on as well. There was, there was all kinds of means of actually writing contracts, but that didn't mean that everybody did that, um, animal hides and whatever. But that didn't mean that everybody had access to that or did that. And it also doesn't mean that people knew how to read. And it also doesn't mean that people knew how to write their names. So they could have a contract that was solely based on a kiss because there wasn't actually the education that would be involved in signing your name. And signing your name is very different as well contractually. So signing your name contractually, what we're signing when we sign contracts is actually we're signing under what's called our fiction. Uh, which is a whole other story. Um, if you don't know what signing under your fiction means, you can by all means look up information on sovereignty. Head on over to some classes on sovereignty and find out what signing under your fiction means. So we we have uh, all of this, all these different things that have to do with us 
being bound into contracts. And for this particular show, I'm not gonna go into the sovereignty aspects of it. I have information on that, but I am not an expert on that whatsoever. I am a little bit more uh, aware of how kisses have become contracts. So we will be talking specifically about that in this, this episode. So I'm curious for those of you out there listening, have any of you ever kissed somebody and then you found out that they were like in love with you and you landed in a relationship and you're like, whoa, how did that happen? I just thought that was a kiss. Whoa, wow. Well, are your kisses that powerful that people like fall for you? They just drop at your doorstep and they're ready to, for you to take them in? Could be. It's, um, I think maybe... It's, I don't even know that it's an age thing. I don't even know that that's uh, even part of it. Um, I was talking to a client friend today and, and she's in her mid sixties and she was talking about guys she's dating these days. And uh, one of them, she said, not naming names here. So this is pretty vague information, but she was saying that somebody she was dating uh, figured that because he was turned on by the kiss that she owed him because he had an erection due to the kids, she kind of owed him, he thought, at least a hand job or something. This guy's in his 60s. So he actually said, I assumed uh, that you would blah, blah, blah. And she said, I never said that. And so sometimes kisses are an assumed contract that either get you engaged or get you into situations where the person thinks you owe them like seriously. So yes, even though he had an erection, he thought that he deserved a hand job because of the kiss, even though she was specific that that was not the case. So how we get ourselves into unspoken contracts, contracts we didn't even know uh, we were part of, how does that happen? These obligations are so bizarre, aren't they? But when we look energetically back at like all these things that kisses have meant historically, and like you, you are now in a legally binding contract because you have kissed somebody. If we're still holding on to any of those beliefs, I'm just wondering if collectively we can shift that energy and we can flip that energy and we can ask for that to change because how ridiculous is it that a kiss would be a contract and all of a sudden you are obligated to somebody, whether that's to be involved with them, to date them, to give them sexual favors that you didn't even know you were uh, supposed to be obligated to. What a crack of crock. So there is no choice in that contract, is there? No, it's an obligation. And I think it's just funny and ridiculous that this is going on in 2022, that people still have a point of view that if you've kissed somebody, it's not that it's serious, but you somehow owe them. So whether you owe them your life or your marriage or your virginity or a hand job or a blow job or whatever it happens to be, what the heck? Kisses are no longer contracts that I'm aware of, other than when people are getting married in religious, um, situ you know, if they're getting married in, in churches, mosques, um, temples, then kisses are part of the, the ritual and the contract actually is sealed with a kiss. So what, what when we look at this, there are different kisses where we've signed contracts. And then there have been things like the kisses that represent death, right? So we'll talk a little bit about those. When we think about um, how, you know, I think about many different things that have to do with the kisses that represent death, the ki kisses that represent true love, like the snow white kiss of you must find true love to wake you out of your slumber. We have made kisses incredibly significant, have we not? That a kiss could wake you out of a coma of like, what was it, Snow White's 99 years? Crazy. And uh, Slavic people in general, and more, I think, I'm, I can only speak for Slavic people as my heritage is, is Serbian um, and a few other things as well. But on the Serbian side, everybody kisses three times, representing the Holy Trinity. So, you know, some uh, other 
Slavs do it two times, but Serbian Slavs, we do it three times. And it's all about the Holy Trinity. So yes, people will kiss. They will overkiss. They'll kiss on the lips. They'll kiss on the cheeks. So the Holy Trinity kiss is on the cheeks. It's a very specific direction, right, left, right. You, you, it's very uh, specific. And then, you know, I see Italians doing it. I see a lot of Europeans doing it um, only because that's really what I see a lot of. But I'm sure a lot of other cultures have this sort of um, this as well. And then you have cultures who will not even, they'll respect your space and they'll just back away and bow, right? So different than the kiss. So we have like this intimacy for some reason that we think we just have a right to get on your face. And I think it's partly why I have a thing where I don't really like people touching my face is it's been overly touched in my life. Anyhow, we're going to be talking about the kiss is of death next as those, those are our contracts as well. You know, you get that kiss Snow White gets that kiss and wakes up out of slumber. That's an interesting contract that was placed in a curse. Let's talk about those next. So you're listening to The Pleasure Zone here on Inspired Choices Network, and we'll be right back after this commercial. Are you secretly a voyeur, wondering what's going on in other people's sex lives? What if now is the time for a totally different sexual evolution? Are you interested in people who are pioneers of different sexual and pleasurable practices? Lean in now with Melitza Yelenich, where she will entice you and your body to know your own pleasure zone. On the Pleasure Zone radio show with sensual movement artist Melitza Yelenich, you'll receive tools, inspiration, and a foundation to allow yourself to receive more in your sex life, and quite possibly other areas of your life as well. Listen for the Pleasure Zone with Melitza. Every Monday at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 7 p.m. Central Time, 6 p.m. Mountain Time, and 5 p.m. Pacific Time on InspiredChoicesNetwork.com. Are you a subject matter expert? Are you here to share your expertise with an audience waiting to hear from you in only the way you can deliver? Are you ready to have your voice amplified across the airwaves? Inspired Choices Network has a global radio platform streaming to millions of people across the world. Professionally produced and supported by an accomplished team every step of the way, you can broadcast from anywhere in the world knowing your voice matters and we ensure it is delivered with ease and efficiency. Eager to hear your message, the world awaits. Contact us today to become an Inspired Choices Network radio host. Email become a host at inspiredchoicesnetwork.com. This is The Pleasure Zone with sensual movement artist Melitza Yelenich. To participate in the program today, join our live studio audience in our chat room at InspiredChoicesNetwork.com. You can also make the choice to ask or comment by email, info at MelitzaYelenich.com. Now, back to the program. Welcome back, my sweet pleasure seekers. So um, this little segment... Um, I just felt like, hey, let's talk about kisses that represent things like betrayal, death, all that fun stuff. Because why not? Because usually we don't think of kisses that way. We usually think of kisses as something erotic and pleasurable. And we don't even necessarily think of them as contractual, even though that's really what they probably started as in ancient Roman times as contractual. Even though the literature goes back to the Ve- some Vedic scriptures in 3500 BC, uh, where the mouth on mouth and the sound that came from the mouth on mouth was incredibly pleasurable. That was actually more of a description of a kiss, but not called a kiss. So the word kiss itself, we'll look at that um, as well. In a lot of languages, the, the word kiss is more like, um, uh, it's very similar to like love. So that's, I think that's interesting too. When I think about the languages I know, a lot of the words that are the same as kiss are very similar to love, but um, kiss itself, not necessarily, and not kiss the band either. So when we're looking at kisses as a romantic act, that's a little different, right? You're kissing somebody to bring them in to get them turned on. But now let's look at betrayal. So for those of you who know the story of Jesus and Judas, 
Jesus actually was kissed by Judas, right, as, as a sign that he was being identified so that people knew um, the people who were going to be, so that Judas uh, was showing exactly who Jesus was to betray Jesus. Um, and that kiss led to Jesus being taken away. So that's quite the betrayal kiss. Now, some literature that is mafia literature, like when you look at the Godfather, I think that that kiss in the Godfather, two or three, I can't remember, um, that kiss is incredibly interesting because it also is like that betrayal kiss. I will kiss you and you are dead. So kind of uh, we've taken some historical context, which We'll say it's historical, could be mythological, could be religious, could be, you know, whatever context you want to think of the Bible in. Um, we've taken that story of Judas and Jesus. We've taken it and it's been kind of translated over that kiss that's the betrayal that leads to death gets taken over into mafia stories. So that's fascinating too, right? Where kiss can be like somebody kisses you and then all of a sudden you're dead. There are, I think kissing stories are fascinating. There's, um, I was watching, I love Murdoch, as you guys who watch this show uh, all the time probably know or listen to my show know that I love this show, Murdoch Mysteries. And there was an episode a few years ago about a kissing bandit who uh, had poison lipstick and would kill with a kiss as well. So that was kind of a fun uh, story is uh, storyline as well and it took them a while to figure out it was the lipstick that did it the poisonous lipstick so those kissing stories about you know and I, and I was mentioning before break about Snow White because that's the first one that kind of jumped into my mind no it wasn't Snow White it was yes it was Snow White as well but she ate the apple and she had to get the kiss of a loved one as well and same with um the one who had uh I can't remember, um, but she pricked her finger. The one who pricked her finger and fell asleep also had to have the kiss of the one who, who uh, loved her as well. So all these stories of the kiss that wakes you from a deep, deep sleep, almost comatose state, is kind of a very deep promise that kiss can bring life. And in some ways, interesting when you think about how, uh, even doing mouth to mouth resuscitation could be in some ways, I guess, construed a bit like a kiss of life as well, if you, you know. And maybe at the time when those stories were written, people didn't have the words for, you know, mouth to mouth resuscitation. So the reference to it might have been, even in the story, somebody might have seen something like that where somebody breathed life into another person and got their lungs going again, got, it, got them back on track, and they might have called it a kiss. We don't really know. We don't really know what the reference was or who, what these authors of these stories saw, but I'm thinking that on some level, these ideas of being kissed back to life probably is a reference to something more like being given oxygen and being given life, but that's just my assumption and presumption where my mind goes to logic and thinks, what did they see that made them think that? What did they experience that made them think that a kiss could bring you back to life? So it could be that, right? So betrayal kisses are interesting. I think they're, they're fascinating and interesting in that, um, you know, there is, there is this, uh, Kisses are supposed to be so tender and loving, but I don't know if you if you've ever been um, watching any of these shows where the person gets that kiss of death. It's kind of like a oh, like you know, and then you almost look for it. Like for me, I almost now look for it in shows where it's like, oh, that person just got the kiss; they're dead. But I like watch a lot of murder mysteries. So I look for that in murder mysteries. Oh, that person got kissed, they're dead. But sometimes you'll find that. That's a habit that they do in writing things and stories that you can see that coming. So kisses of death. If you have any other ideas on kisses of death, I'd be fascinated to hear that. And also the you know, betrayal kisses. I'm sure there's a lot of them in literature. I'm sure there's a lot in movies as well. And I know for sure that I'm, if there are at least two stories like um, 
it wasn't it was Snow White and then the other one as well where she pricks her finger whatever that one was called that those ones would uh sleeping beauty they would both be ones where yeah the the person has to come and rescue them it has to be the love of their life and for some reason the love of their life always has to be a man and it always has to be a man they don't really even know which in some ways isn't that freakishly weird that the love of your life your true your one true love is somebody you've maybe met once um so the, there is a question in the chat room. What is the kiss when someone is going off to war? That's a good question. I'm not sure what that one's called, but there are kisses of like, yeah, that goodbye kiss where you might not ever see the person again. There were some at the end of the war, it, actually in uh, 1945, uh, April, I think it was April 2nd, 1945, there was like a very famous kiss that happened um, and I'll be referencing some famous kisses in the next segment. So we'll talk about that. Yeah, that kiss of going off to war is definitely another very interesting final kiss. Also, when somebody is passing away, you'll often find that people will give the final kiss. And even when my grandmother died, I remember people were like kissing her in her coffin. And I thought, I don't know that she would like that. <laughs> Um, but yes, people like kiss dead bodies even, which is fascinating. I don't know if, if the idea is that you kiss the dead body and it's supposed to come back to life, like in Sleeping Beauty, but it's, it's interesting. And yeah, so lots of people do kiss people when they've passed on and they kiss hello and they kiss goodbye. Absolutely. Uh, I find it interesting that if anybody kissed my mother when she passes away, if I'm, if I'm still alive before she like when she's passed away, I think she would be really pissed because she is not a person who likes kissing or hugging. And if people were like touching her body when she is out of it, I think that would really be annoying to her. So have some, you know, just if people didn't like it when they were alive, don't do it to them when they're dead, just saying. So those kisses of death, yeah. So, or the, or the hope, you know, you can also be, uh, anytime when somebody is even going into surgery or something and there's potential that they could die, there's usually that final kiss is it that is significant like you're going off into something. Um, and do we have that illusion that thought that kiss kisses bring life, like the kiss of life, the kiss of death, the kiss of life, the kiss of breath, which could be a breath as well. So, so many different ideas on that front when it comes to all of that. So, so when you're thinking about um, all these like different scenarios with kissing, I'm wondering which ones to you are the most fascinating? Like, I think I'm by far most fascinated by the kisses that represent things that are more tragic. Not that I enjoy those more, but I'm more fascinated by how we would um, bring them up and utilize them in our lives in so many different scenarios. So um, also sometimes people kiss things for good luck now that I think about it. Like um, they might kiss, say they go to, they go to like the racetrack and they kiss their ticket or something as if it's gonna bring good luck. So I think we kiss a lot of things. And I know in uh, Orthodox Christian uh, religion, we kiss icons as well. And those are, you know, the icon, iconography is paintings of old say, like saints. So. There is something uh, with that. And there's also kissing of <clears throat> like different things like um, religious figures having rings that are uh, symbols of different religions and kissing those as well. So one of the comments in the chat room is I think a, that a kiss of love and to be kissed and realize it's the kiss of death would freak me out. Yeah, if you thought you were getting a kiss that's love and then it ends up being the kiss of death would truly be freakish. And also, yes, kissing the feet of religious people is really common throughout the world as well. So kissing the hands, the feet and icons is also different forms of kissing that uh, in some ways are reaffirming that you are dedicated to whatever that belief system is. So, you know, kissing iconography for Christian Orthodox is kind of like an affirmation of saying, yes, I, I am, I believe in this and I'm paying my obeisance to this. Um, I, it is an obeisance in a way, which means that you obey that 
that. So, uh, and an allegiance in a way as well that you are saying that you are um, under that in a way. So, all fascinating, isn't it? Although different ways we kiss and what we kiss for. I mean, I think there's there are actually history books on and different books that are solely dedicated to kissing, and they're like hundreds of pages. So. If you're fascinated by this topic, you know, go out, find yourself some of these books because they are fascinating. I, I didn't get one yet. I just today was just thinking about this topic. So this is uh, just kind of fresh off the top of my head with all kinds of different ideas related to kisses. And I've been watching some shows recently with, uh, with my child and we were, we've been watching a lot of things on um, the media and the history of, of uh, the portrayal of different gay characters on TV and, and radio and movies uh, over the last century. And for me, I was mostly watching and noticing all the different places where different gay characters were not allowed to kiss, or it was like the first time that ever happened. So. We are going to talk about some of those groundbreaking moments in history as well, different places uh, that we have seen some groundbreaking kisses in the world that have changed the course of history. So we'll be talking about that in the next segment. You're listening to The Pleasure Zone here on Inspired Choices Network, and we'll be right back after this commercial. Are you secretly a voyeur, wondering what's going on in other people's sex lives? What if now is the time? for a totally different sexual evolution. Are you interested in people who are pioneers of different sexual and pleasurable practices? Lean in now with Melitza Jelanić, where she will entice you and your body to know your own pleasure zone. On the Pleasure Zone radio show with sensual movement artist Melitza Jelanić, you'll receive tools, inspiration, and a foundation to allow yourself to receive more in your sex life and quite possibly other areas of your life as well. Listen for The Pleasure Zone with Milica every Monday at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 7 p.m. Central Time, 6 p.m. Mountain Time, and 5 p.m. Pacific Time on InspiredChoicesNetwork.com. Interested in masturbating for money, copulating for consciousness, and pleasuring on purpose? 21 Days of Sexual Magicism with sensual movement artist Melitza Jelanić is an exploration of tools, processes, and actions that you can use to create more for your life, your body, your money inflows, and so much more. Graduated learning for all levels of interest. Learn at your own pace via video classes or join the yearly live class. Take a peek at www.melitzajelanić.com. How wonderful would it be to carry your favorite Inspired Choices Network host with you throughout your day? Well, now you can. Inspired Choices Network now has its very own mobile app. Our free app offers live streaming shows along with thousands of podcasts and TV episodes. Our shows cover a wide variety of topics. Whether you're waking up with us, carrying us through the day, and taking us to bed with you, we're always here for you to enjoy. We're easy to find. Just search for Inspired Choices Network in the Apple App Store or Google Play Store. This is The Pleasure Zone with sensual movement artist Melitza Jelanić. To participate in the program today, join our live studio audience in our chat room at InspiredChoicesNetwork.com. You can also make the choice to ask or comment by email, info at melitzajelanich.com. Now, back to the program. Welcome back, my sweet pleasure seekers. So, then this little segment, I wanted to talk about some of the historical kisses that kind of blew people's minds and might have even changed the world and the way we see things. So, going right back to the first filmed kiss, the very first film kiss was done in 1896. Um, Thomas Edison filmed it in his New Jersey studio. Uh, it was done by May Irwin and John C. Rice. And it was actually just called The Kiss. And 
part of what they were doing was they were performing in a play and Thomas Edison decided, or they decided that they wanted to film it. And because film was able to do such a close-up of them, the close-up was considered really something for its time. It was quite risque and it was quite um, shocking to people who would see exactly the same kiss on stage and think nothing of it. But because it was a close-up, it was almost like to the level of porn pornographic in a way. Um, but that was our first one in 1896. And then what I didn't know and I found out doing some research for this was that the first black kiss on film was in 1898, so only two years later. What I love about this is that this footage was only recently found, by recent I mean like in the last five years, because I think the last time I did a show about uh, kisses or the history of kisses, um, what I remembered from the very first time I saw uh, or what was considered the first black kiss on, on a film, I thought was Harry Belafonte and Carmen. Um, I say that because my mom is like a huge Harry Belafonte fan. So that wasn't it. No, but Harry Belafonte did come up again in the news in 1968 when Petula Clark touched his arm in public. So it was an interracial touch where a white woman touched a black man's arm. Ooh, the hysteria that went on. Can you imagine? Yes, those that wasn't even that long ago, right? That's only 54 years ago that we were that insane on this planet that it made that it was a big deal. But I love this. So the 19 the 1898 uh, film, I don't even want to say the name of it because it's quite offensive these days, but let's just say it's like a something good kiss, something good blank kiss. And you can assume what they filled in with that blank. Um, you can look it up. It's um, the, the performers were Saint Subtle and Gertie Brown, and it was just a short film. And they were at the film when historians have looked at it, they said that it was actually really beautiful. The couple was dancing. The two were dancing. They weren't a couple necessarily, but they were dancing, really enjoying themselves and they kissed and it seemed very natural and playful. So I think that's lovely. It was um, it was actually filmed by a white man, surprisingly, William Selig in Chicago. So that's fun. That's a great, another historical um, kiss of the day. The other historical kiss that you guys probably are aware of, um, there's a kiss that happened in uh, New York in 19, I think it's New York or Brooklyn, in 1945. Uh, it, was, it was Manhattan, actually, in the the war in Japan was over and this woman ran out into the streets and the sailor who was a little bit drunk grabbed her and kissed her and the uh, the two there were two photographers there who caught the kiss even though she apparently was like struggling to get away because she didn't even know who this man was. This picture is historical. Uh, I've seen it. I know that you've probably seen references to it in movies. You've probably seen all, all kinds of um, different references to it. I think it was even in, um, I used to watch Quantum Leap and I think they did the reenactment of that uh, in Quantum Leap as well. I have to check. The Quantum Leap, the original Quantum Leap, not the ones they're making now. Um, yeah, I think they did a reenactment of that. And then it's also been done on Star Trek. They went back to that moment as well. Um, I love Star Trek. There'll be another reference to Star Trek coming up. So uh, the Navy sailor, his name was George Mendoza, and the uh, woman that he was kissing, Zimmer, uh, she she was didn't even know what was happening. So the photographers of that famous kiss are Alfred Eisenstein and Victor Jorgensen. Uh, so if you've never seen it, it's called The Kissing Sailor, the mystery behind the photo that ended World War II. Um, that is, it is in that book and you'll find it there, but you can also just look up the, I believe you can just look up the, uh, the Navy sailor and the nurse painting in 1945. That one was super famous. It's one of the most iconic pictures. Uh, one of the most iconic kisses that most people have actually seen and know what that looks like. So I, earlier I mentioned 1968, Petula Clark and Harry Belafonte and the fact that Petula Clark touched Harry Belafonte's arm. Well, that same year, 1968, we have an amazing uh, thing that happens between William Shatner and Nichelle Nichols on Star Trek. Um, although it wasn't the 
first interracial kiss on US television. It was the most famous. It seems to be the most famous because it had the most impact. Um, people went quite crazy over it. It had, uh, it had quite, <laughs> people were like losing their minds over it. They wanted to get Star Trek off TV. Um, the character that Michelle Nichols plays, Ahura, um, was considered by Martin Luther King one of the most significant characters for in um, for the for the movement for for uh, all rights for blacks. So the black rights movement that and I might be naming it wrong and I apologize for that. But um, yeah, that character Ahura was uh, she was actually called by. Martin Luther King to say, please stay on the show. We need this. We need you in our movement. We need this is making, um, this is creating waves. This is creating change. Uh, another reason why I absolutely love Star Trek because the vision of the future of equity, equality, um, and people actually having rights is beautiful to me. Uh, one of the things we don't have historically, well, we have it historically, but we don't really have a lot of um, we don't have a lot of it is, is any so we interracial kisses in 1968. It takes a very long, like a, over a decade, I think it was, until we actually see gay characters kissing on TV. I remember seeing, and I, it might not be the first one, but you know, my love of Star Trek, I was watching DS9, Deep Space Nine, for those of you who don't know it. Uh, on Deep Space Nine, the character Dax, well, the character who's got the symbiont Dax, um, she is she kisses a woman in that, and I think that's the first time Star Trek ever allowed for a gay couple to kiss. And although it's hard to say what you know what trills are because they have so many different, um, they've got their symbiont, and it's hard to say what what they're, um, how they identify necessarily. So we don't know, are they gay? Are they not? Are they homosexual? Who knows? But it was a woman on woman kiss, which was very huge for its time. And that was in 1993. So 93, 94, something like that. And prior to that, you know, there were characters on TV that were gay. I've seen them kind of hold hands a little bit. Um, you might have seen, I think there was one instance where a man kissed a man, but I'm telling you it's rare and it's unique. So even now it's not, uh, we're starting to see it. It's more common now, but that's only in the last maybe decade that you're starting to see shows that have characters who are allowed to kiss each other that aren't, that aren't straight monogamous couples. Although you can see non-monogamous couples kissing each other as well. There was definitely a push the kiss is one of those symbols that definitely gives the push for certain values. Like we will only allow for certain kisses to show up. We'll only allow for, you know, monogamous, straight, cisgender kisses to show up. That's all we're going to let show up on the world because God forbid, you know, other people can have a reference for their life or what they would, you know, so they can identify with some characters. God forbid that happens. Yeah. So there's been a lot of repression and kisses are kind of like the, especially in, in TV and in, in movies and things, kisses are one of those things that have created a lot of groundbreaking um, uh, different, like it, they're groundbreaking, right? So when, you know, when we had the first interracial kiss, then all of a sudden you started to see more of that. When we had the first gay kiss and you started to see more of that, which is amazing. And I think uh, we need more of these uh, situations so that these things are just, just as average as watching your average heterosexual scenes because they're everywhere. Those have definitely been indoctrinated into us as being the normal. So, and I will be talking about media and normalcy and how we've been kind of like, media has definitely brought some ideas of what is okay, what is normal, and what we see uh, as a reference all the time to what it, we think is supposed to be normal, average, and we don't even have references to other things, so we wouldn't even know if they're okay uh, to be or to have in our world. So 
the historical cases are fascinating because some of them are so groundbreaking that they they almost shut down networks they almost shut down shows tvs movies movie theaters they some of them even caused uh, somewhat of like riots in their time. And some of them were so hidden, like that 1898 movie with a black couple kissing was like literally hidden in the archives so deep that it took till 2017 for it to come out. And luckily it was in good enough shape that people could still see it, which is incredible really. So we probably wouldn't see that for quite a while longer, which I was pretty sure was in Carmen. Um, but I could be uh, wrong about that. That's just my rememberings on that front. Um, and if you haven't seen any of the things I'm mentioning, go ahead and check them out because they're kind of fun. It's just a fun thing to notice this stuff. Uh, and if you are like wondering what episode of Star Trek that is, just look up the uh, just look up episode. I think it's called Plato's Daughter, um, where Nichelle Nichols and William Shatner kiss. And, they, and the networks did not want this to happen. They were livid. So the fact that it got out there was only because William Shatner refused to do a take that, um, that didn't have the kiss in it, where when he did do those takes, he would screw up his face so they couldn't use those takes. He wanted that to happen. So uh, I think that's pretty amazing. And to be able to like stand your ground and stick behind you know, stick behind your guns on that one and just say, I'm doing this and this is going to be groundbreaking and it needs to happen. And the timing could have been better. Uh, it was right. There was so much going on for, for uh, equal rights. Uh, it was also a year before Stonewall. If you're not sure what Stonewall is, you can check that out, but I'll probably do an entire episode on Stonewall because it was an amazing event in history that changed a lot of things for uh, LGBTQ rights. So We'll be talking about that at some time, I'm sure. So we're going to talk more about kisses and our kisses contracts. How did they end up being contracts? What the heck? And think about all these different ways that these people almost lost their contracts with their jobs for these kisses too. Wild. So we'll be talking a little bit more about that when we come back from this next commercial. You're listening to The Pleasure Zone here on Inspired Choices and Network, and we'll be right back after this commercial. Are you secretly a voyeur, wondering what's going on in other people's sex lives? What if now is the time for a totally different sexual evolution? Are you interested in people who are pioneers of different sexual and pleasurable practices? Lean in now with Melitza Yelenich, where she will entice you and your body to know your own pleasure zone. On the Pleasure Zone radio show with sensual movement artist Melitza Yelenich. You'll receive tools, inspiration, and a foundation to allow yourself to receive more in your sex life, and quite possibly other areas of your life as well. Listen for The Pleasure Zone with Milica every Monday at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 7 p.m. Central Time, 6 p.m. Mountain Time, and 5 p.m. Pacific Time on InspiredChoicesNetwork.com. This is The Pleasure Zone with sensual movement artist Milica Yelenich. To participate in the program today, join our live studio audience in our chat room at InspiredChoicesNetwork.com. You can also make the choice to ask or comment by email, info at MelitzaYelenich.com. Now, back to the program. Welcome back, my sweet, sweet pleasure seekers. Uh, so we've been talking about kisses and a kiss isn't a contract. Now, if you haven't heard that song, if you didn't during the breaks, go and look for Flight of the Concords, uh, Kiss is Not a Contract song, please do. They are funny. I mean, you might need the reference of their show to understand the characters and what they're going through when they make up these crazy freaking songs. Um, they also have songs that are not in reference to their show. They do not have a very big following, but I'm telling you, they are a freaking riot. If you need a good laugh and you love a New Zealand accent, they're for you. They, uh, one of their jokes is that they are the, the, top, the top four band in New Zealand and there are only four bands in New Zealand. So there you go, or that's what they say. 
So for those of you who are listening and you're curious about what I do and what I offer, I would love for you to go over to my website, melitzajelinek.com. On there, you'll find that I have classes listed. I have currently four classes that are available to the, uh, a few actually, three that are already available now that you can do in your own time. They're an evergreen product. And I've got one class that is an ongoing one-year program. And I still have a few months left in that program. You can still join in uh, for my psychic development school. Really, it's all about learning to trust you. And so many times in relationship, we just do not have trust in ourselves and we tend to give it up to other people, whether it's to our friends and their opinions or whether it's to the partner. Um, either way, we tend to give up ourselves. So this is all about learning to trust you, the psychic development class that you can get on my Teachable. Uh, and you can find those links on melitzajelinik.com. And when you're over there, jump on in and and uh, join my, my mailing list by getting, you can click on the do's, don'ts, maybe list, and you can get, uh, you can get my free download for the do's, don'ts, maybe list that can get you started on figuring out what you do like, what you don't like, and what you might like when it comes to sex and intimacy. Um, the list that I provide is just a list of about I don't know, maybe a hundred things that you can add, uh, put into your columns and see what works for you. I just started you off with some ideas, but of course you can add your own. Those, uh, the list is pretty vanilla, so it shouldn't be too shocking for you. And of course you can add again, whatever you like to that list. Um, if, and when you're on there and you would like to book an appointment with me, you can do that as well. My booking link is on the website at the very bottom of the footer, and you can find that there as well. If you're looking for information on what I do, that is also on my website. Uh, so yes, head over to melitzajalanik.com. You will find all kinds of great stuff in there and stuff will be added uh, over the next few months as well as, as I'm developing more classes and putting them up um, and being available for all of you. So, oh, good times. So kissing. So I have to say, I'm like a very picky and particular kisser. And when I do like kissing somebody, oh, I really like it. And when I don't, I really don't. And that might be true for you too. So when a kiss is a contract for you, you might actually be more like, I really like that kiss and I want more of that. That might be part of it. And it might be like, that kiss was like not happening and I'm not interested in anymore. I think kisses can tell you a lot about a person. Um, when a kiss is incredibly aggressive, I, you know, I tend to notice that is something of a quality that comes when somebody's feeling um, insecure or they have, uh, they really have this intense desire to please, but not really ask for what the person wants. And I don't know, I think I could do an evaluation of the many kisses I've had over my life. And you can really see some personality qualities that come out in the kiss. Even though uh, kisses don't have to be contracts, we do know that randomly they still are when you are getting that kiss in your marriage, uh, you know, whether you're getting, you know, whether you're getting kissed in a religious, uh, in front of a, you know, in a religious setting or whether you're getting a kiss when you're just going to the justice of the peace. There's generally the, you may kiss the bride, which is always funny, or kiss the groom. Um, why not you can just kiss each other? When I wrote the vows, I believe I rewrote it as you can kiss now. <laughs> I rewrote them because I like to have the idea that you don't have to, um, you don't have ownership over another person. So you don't kiss so-and-so, it's that you're kissing each other. So kisses can be ownership and they can be contractual like i kissed you i now own you well that's a load of crock so if you've been in situations and i would love to hear it so put comments uh, if you are uh, listening on a on a site that allows for comments i would love to hear your comments on uh, if you've ended up kissing somebody ended up in a relationship and you wondered how the heck did that happen Oh, crazy times. It's possible. And you never know, right? It depends on where the people are at and how serious this kiss means to them. And can it just be a kiss? Can a kiss just be a kiss? Can it just be something pleasurable? Can it also be choice? Does it have to be an obligation that leads to something else? Because the person is turned on and apparently owe them. Yeah, that's a 
load of crockapoo. So no, uh, I don't think that kisses still need to be contracts, but if you want them to be, absolutely, that is just a choice. I do encourage you to have fun with your kisses and try not to make them too serious and experiment with different ways of kissing. If you've kissed the same way your entire life, maybe change it up, maybe get gentler, maybe um, allow for the energy to build more. And I've talked about different kinds of kisses where you can have sort of an energy kiss where it builds more. Those are my favorite, where the energy builds so much that your body just wants to kiss and it's not like a forced push. So until next week, stay tuned in. And turn Thank you for listening to The Pleasure Zone with sensual movement artist Milica Yelenic. The Pleasure Zone returns next Monday at 8 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Central, 6 p.m. Mountain, and 5 p.m. Pacific on InspiredChoicesNetwork.com. We hope you'll join us. Until then, have the best week of your life by choosing to be turned on and tuned in to your body.